Grinard Island lies in Grinard Bay on the northwest coast of Scotland. It was here in 1942 that the very first scientifically controlled VW field trials were carried out. A team had been set up at Thornton in 1940 to advise the government as to how serious the threat of VW was. Part of their work was necessarily the development of practical weapons, which had finally to be tested with actual infectious agents. There were no facilities anywhere for these tests, which were of course much more hazardous than comparable chemical warfare trials, and so this island was picked to save its isolation. The rugged mountainous mainland seen in these pictures did not help in getting the steady offshore winds which were needed for trials. Two exploratory trials were done in July 1942 with bombs fired at rest. In September, including one bomb dropped from an aircraft, and a third expedition was made in the following summer when four trials were done with the four-pound bomb. This film was taken during the second year. Sheep were used for the trials because they're particularly sensitive to inhaled anthrax. They were kept at the mainland camp and only transferred to the island when required for trials. The reason why everyone moves rather quickly is that this was photographed at silent film speed. The Navy helped here by providing a motor fishing vessel as they did also by giving a lot of other help from the Boom Defence Depot at Alt Bay on nearby Loch U. The sheep were towed across in a dinghy like this, or on occasion a tank landing craft was used with success. On the island they were herded by a shepherd and his dog, keeping of course always to the uninfected clean area, and driven into a corral until wanted. This emphasizes the convenience of using small animals, which wasn't possible in these trials. The sheep being rounded up in the corral. Here they were marked before being put in the exposure. The dirty area was clearly marked and separated off from the clean side. The sheep are being put into exposure crates. The crate is necessary to hold the animal in the right place on the layout and to ensure that it faces the cloud. And also, of course, it helps in handling the sheep, which are heavy and pretty agile. It was important to establish beyond a doubt that animals contracting the disease did so by direct inhalation of the cloud from the bomb. You can see here how they were covered with fabric to keep spores off the fleece. And later we'll be seeing how they were hooded after the trial to stop transfer of spores, and how they were tethered out of reach of one another. We can have a look at the sampling gear used in most of the trials. A butane gas cylinder was modified as a vacuum tank. This is the device sometimes called the rat trap, a simple contraption holding an electric squib which grips the folded rubber vacuum tube until the squib is fired to start the
bursting impact fuse. It is fitted with an electric fuse for bursting at rest. Dropping trials from aircraft were attempted, but only one was done. It was more convenient to use the Pittman inverted mortar to fire the bomb against the ground. Here they're fitting up the mortar on the gallows. The OP is the low point for the trial. From here, an electric cable goes either to the inverted mortar or to a bomb at ground level for a static burst, and another cable to operate the line of sampling points. The men wear ordinary cloth overalls, rubber boots and gloves, a respirator with particulate filter, cloth hood to keep the hair clean and reduce risk of face piece leaks. The canister is worn on the shoulder and is covered with a cloth pre-filter. bombs fired and the wind carries the cloud towards the line of animals and impingers. This is a static burst. Only one trial was attempted on The cloud has passed, the gear is packed up. The impingers are taken to a point upwind and washed out. The contents go into screw cap bottles and are taken to the mainland lab. The rest of the gear stays on the dirty side for the next trial. Here the impinger is removed from its clip. You can see how the sheep are hooded to reduce risk of cross infection. This and other precautions ensure that infection from inhalation of the primary aerosol from the bomb. On arrival at the holding area, the sheep are uncrated and tethered to lines. The first question, they showed conclusively that bacteria could be put up as simple weapons and that the result might be much more striking than with a chemical filling. This was, of course, something that had never been demonstrated before. The later trials were mainly concerned with putting the information on a quantitative basis. A lot of tests with harmless simulant chargings had been done at Thornton, so the first thing was to prove that the anthrax spores behaved like a simulant. Also, the dosage necessary to infect sheep had been measured in the lab, and it was hoped to correlate this with dosages measured in field tests. Both these objects were achieved. A setback was when a bomb dropped from the air failed to infect any sheep, but a single elsewhere on hard sand showed that the very soft, boggy peat on Grinard was the cause of the trouble. <laughs> Anyone who believes that sheep are docile and slow-moving should try catching them, particularly if he's wearing full protective clothing. We can now see what happens during the seven-day holding period. On the third day after exposure, the casualties begin. Dead sheep can be seen further down the line. It is, of course, necessary to confirm that they've died of anthrax. This can be done by simply taking a blood film. Most of the animals, however, were given a more thorough Results were very satisfactory and confirmed figures. On the graph of dosages, the red dots show that all the cows died, except those at the extreme fringes. One symptom is a blood exudate, but as I said, post-mortem was usually carried out to confirm appearances. The facilities for autopsy show the characteristic of these pioneer trials. Later workers may well remember that good results do not require elaborate equipment. But Paul Files, distinguished by his individualistic refusal to wear a hood, Reggie Bamford wielding the knife, 
and the taller figures of David Anderson and Donald Woods. One useful feature of this operating theatre is running water. There's a little waterfall close by. is being taken irrespective of the films and lab painting nation. to many people. another bench to remove boots and swing over the in Speed from the dispectors across the sea. The dispectors are and the clothes were subjected to free steam for one hour. not where the coming the clothing was negligible. The clothing being packed into the distant sectors. It being a convenient form of solid Here, bleeding 
prepared acid bleach an extremely Later, we turned our attention to trials at sea. Possible to deconstruct our island. The yearly inspections are still showing virulent anthrax. The risk to man or animal is probably slight now. 